related. Then I'll introduce fallibilism. Uh, we'll look at a couple quick examples of, of fallibilism. This is Peirce. Peirce and Popper are two big names in establishing the fallibilist view. Uh, I'll contrast fallibilism with skepticism, look at some objections, um, and then distinguish between a sort of a more moderate fallibilism and a full-blown fallibilism. <coughs> So what we saw last week in looking at Descartes is he has a particular project. Um, his skeptical project is designed uh, to isolate certainty, to identify certainty. And why is, he, why is he interested in certainty? Well, he wants to figure out a way of making uh, a contribution to the, what he calls the sciences, to establish something that has a chance of lasting. And in order to do that, he thinks he needs to establish something with certainty. Um, in order to do that, he uses this method of doubt, uh, working through those three levels of increasingly deep doubt. He um, arrives at the cogito, uh, and on that basis, he comes up with the idea that clear and distinct ideas, or clearly and distinct, clearly and distinctly perceived uh, facts, or things that are clearly per distinctly perceived to be true, those are going to be the ones that are true. That becomes, in a sense, his criterion for truth or knowledge. Um, and in this, as I'm about to show you, he makes uh, um, assumptions about the need for certainty in establishing knowledge and the relationship between inability to doubt and certainty. This is all tied up with his uh, use of the method of, of, of skeptical doubt to identify um, the basis for certainty. So here is a quote that I put up last week, just to go through it this time, but with a couple of phrases highlighted. Some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I'd accepted as true in my childhood and by high, the do highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice, uh, subsequently based on them. So this edifice is doubtful. I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and to start again right from the foundations. If I wanted to establish anything in all the sciences, it was stable and likely to last. That's what his project is. But he thinks in order to do this and accomplish this, it will not be necessary for me to show that all my opinions are false, which is something I could perhaps never manage. Reason now leads me to think that I should hold back my assent from opinions which are not completely certain and indubitable, right? What he's going to do is not believe anything that's not completely certain and indubitable, and indubitable, just as carefully as I do from those which are patently false. So the purpose of rejecting all my opinions will be enough if I find in each of them at least some reason for doubt. If there's any reason for doubt, he's going to reject an opinion. So you see a connection that he's making between knowledge and certainty. Uh, he seems to be assuming that in order to have knowledge we require certainty. At the same time, he's making a connection between certainty and inability to doubt or indubitability. Um, and this method of skeptical doubt, well that's his procedure for trying to figure out how it is that we can be certain of something. What Descartes is up to is something that contrasts with fallibilism. For the fallibilist, we don't need to search for certainty. We should reject this uh, demand for certainty. The fallible simply accepts that as humans we're fallible, that we may not be capable of certainty, that we may never be able to get beyond sort of fallible knowledge. And the thought is that this recognition of fallibility is not a problem for knowledge because, according to the fallibilist, certainty is not needed. We don't need certainty in order to have knowledge. Right? So you could, even if we're not certain, we could still possess knowledge. Now, as I mentioned, Descartes wasn't a skeptic. He didn't mean to be a skeptic, and yet you can get a form of skepticism out of his views, uh, and here's a way of setting up what you might call Cartesian skepticism. Um, it's roughly going to be, well, knowledge requires certainty. Make, take that as an assumption. Knowledge requires certainty. 
we're not capable of having any certainty and you can see how Descartes could appeal to his evil demon scenario um, to show that we're not capable of having any certainty though um, you know, there might be some things he thinks he can be certain of. The evil demon shows we can't be certain of everything, or we can be certain of very little, given that we can't be certain. Well, then it's going to follow that we can't have knowledge. If certainty is required for knowledge and we can't have certainty, then we're not going to have knowledge, and that's going to be the skeptical result. You can call that Cartesian skepticism. Um, the fallibilist is going to have a simple reply, right? Should be pretty clear what the fallibilist is going to say. The fallibilist is simply going to deny this move. The fallibilist will reject the assumption. Knowledge, according to the fallibilist, doesn't require certainty. Given that knowledge doesn't require certainty, we can have knowledge even if we don't have certainty, so we can reject this Cartesian skeptical position. Now, what... Um, what is, what is in dispute at this point then between the Cartesian skeptic and the fallibilist is whether certainty is required for knowledge. But more specifically, we need to ask what is certainty? What is actually involved in certainty? So what's certainty? What's meant by certainty? Well, in the passage that I had before, and then through, I think you'll find this when you look at the meditations, Descartes tends to work with certainty and indubitability uh, in very close association. They're almost interchangeable. Um, you, there's two ways to interpret this. I'm not clear which is the preferred or preferable interpretation. It doesn't really matter. But one way of interpreting this is that for Descartes, indubitability and certainty are the same thing, right? What is it to be certain? Well, it's not to be able to, it's to be unable to doubt. What is it, you know, what is it to be, for something to be indubitable, well, it's to be certain. So one possibility is they're the same thing. Another possibility is that indubitability is a criterion for certitude. So it's not the same thing, it's just you're using uh, inability to doubt as a way of determining that some belief is certain. doesn't really matter which way you go. Either way, indubitability is indicative of certainty for Descartes. Um, if you can't doubt something, then you're going to be certain of it. If it's indubitable, then for Descartes it's going to be certain. Now, there's a problem, right? So here's straightforward objection that you can immediately raise to the idea that to be certain is uh, to, be in, to, to be indubitable is to be certain, or to take, uh, or, or that indubitability is a an indicator of certitude. And the obvious objection, I think, is that being unable to doubt something, well, that's just a reflection upon a psychological state, right? It reflects somebody's inability to, to doubt. It's not in itself something epistemic. Um, and what we're looking for in certainty is something epistemic. So, for example, um, there might be a false belief or an unjustified belief, which for psychological grounds or psychological, as a result of psychological causes, we're just unable to doubt. And what kind of causes might these be? Well, brainwashing, indoctrination, parental influence, peer pressure, etc. All sorts of reasons why we might be incapable of doubting something. But the thought is, the mere inability to bring oneself to doubt some proposition surely isn't an indicator of anything epistemically uh, meritorious, anything epistemically good about that proposition. The mere fact, mere ability to doubt is just going to reflect, or may just reflect, um, a psychological incapacity to doubt it. So we need to look a bit further into what um, certainty might be. It doesn't look like indubitability in its um, should be taken uh, as the quite as being a clear indication of certainty. The um, question then is, uh, what is certainty going to be? Well, one thing that looks to be the case is that if there is a belief that is certain, then in some sense it can't be false, right? If, if it's certain that P, if P is certain, then you think, well, P just got to be true, can't be false. The problem is that, that doesn't help us much either, because now the question is, um, if P just can't be false, does that mean it's impossible for P to be false? Does that mean, in a sense, that 
the proposition is necessarily true? Right? Uh, if some proposition is certain, can't be false, does that mean that it's necessarily true? That doesn't look like the right thing to say. Um, in order to get a little bit further with this, we need to make a distinction between those truths that are contingent and those that are necessary, right? Some truths are going to be necessarily true. They couldn't be any other way, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's going to be necessarily true. Some are going to be contingent. Uh, and this is a, uh, uh, a claim about the people enrolled in this class, not the people in this lecture theater. Uh, it's a contingent proposition that there will roughly 40 students in this class. It's not necessarily the case, right? It could be 40 this year, could be another number next year. All right, so that some truths are necessary and some are contingent. When you say that a belief is certain, you're not saying that that belief is necessarily true. That's not the point. Um, you're saying that you have extraordinarily good reason to believe the proposition. That proposition could be a contingent truth or it could be a necessary truth. Um, and effectively, when you're saying that some belief is certain, that's going to be pretty much the highest possible state of justification you can be in. However you want to put it, basically, if you're certain that P, then that is going to be the highest level of justification you could be in with respect to P. Um, it might be, if you put it, think in these terms, to have the highest possible probability, which is a probability of 1. But one way or the other, the thought is, the certain that P is to have maximal support for the belief that P. And that's going to be distinct from the mere ability or inability to doubt some proposition. Now, having said all that, this is precisely what the fallibilist wants to put in question. The fallibilist view is that this high standard of justification simply isn't necessary in order to have knowledge. And what the fallibilist has a view of humans and our knowledge gathering capacities, that humans are simply fallible creatures, right? That we are um, the kind of things that are capable of, in fact, routinely make mistakes. Sometimes our senses don't get things right, right? So our senses can lead us to have false beliefs because somehow our senses have misled us. Um, we also form views based on available evidence, but the evidence can change or new evidence can come to light and we have to change our beliefs based on new evidence that comes to light. So the beliefs that we hold are going to be shifting as evidence changes, as we might turn out that some of our evidence was mistaken or we simply have new evidence that makes us change our minds. So constant, we're, we're changing our beliefs in a way that reflects variation, difference um, of evidence available to us. Now, the connection between fallibility and skepticism. The fallibilist insists upon human, human fallibility, um, but in fact, the skeptic points to the fallibility, the human fallibility, right? It's not like the skeptic and the fallibilist differ on human fallibility. The skeptic, in fact, was pointing to the fallibility of human knowledge and then drawing a conclusion from it. But there are um, various aspects of skepticism that are pointing to our fallibility. So if you think about academic skepticism, the way they're basing their view on the Socratic dictum that all I know is that I know nothing, that was pointing to Socrates' fallibility. He didn't know anything. Uh, with Peronians, when they were putting up perception that one might have against an opposing perception and the thought was that you would suspend belief, well, that was pointing to the fallibility of perception. Um, and if you think about Descartes with his, at least the first two levels of error, um, the, the fact that sometimes our senses mislead us and question about whether you can tell whether you're awake now or asleep, well, those are, he's pointing to the fallibility um, of our sensory knowledge. So the skeptics pointed to the fallibility of our knowledge acquisition, but the skeptic goes one way and the um, 
fallible goes the uh, another. The skeptic tends to draw a negative conclusion from the fallibility of our senses and other knowledge gathering um, uh, processes and activities. Um, some skeptics obviously draw more negative conclusions than others. So the academic skeptic and some version of Cartesian skepticism draws a more negative conclusion than the Pyrrhonian who simply withholds judgment. By contrast, the fallibilist simply doesn't draw a negative conclusion, doesn't draw that conclusion from our fallibility. Let me try to illustrate this view by briefly looking at two philosophers who um, probably the most famous and influential advocates of fallibilism. The first is C.S. Peirce, the second is Karl Popper. Um, C.S. Peirce, I don't know why his last name is pronounced Peirce, but that's the way I've always heard it pronounced. Um, Charles Sanders Peirce, 19th century, early 20th century uh, figure who was the founder of pragmatism um, before James and Dewey. Um, but Peirce was the one who coined the term fallibilism. Um, I don't know if that makes him the first fallibilist because I'm sure there would have been people who were tending in a fallibilist direction before, but he's the one who invented the terminology. So he's the one that fallibilism traces back to. Um, he was, like Popper actually, thinking about science as a paradigm for the claim of, of fallibilism, thinking mostly, I think, about experimental science. Um, and what he said was that fallibilism expresses the spirit of science. That if you were um, uh, an infallibilist, if you were insisting on certainty in knowledge, that that would actually uh, be an impediment. It would block scientific inquiry. <coughs> Why would he say that? Well, his thought was, take some theory or some law that has been proposed or reportedly identified in science, if you then took that to be beyond question, to be certain, then you'd be blocking inquiry. You'd be preventing inquiry. You'd be standing in the way of further inquiry. And he thought that would be wrong. A um, couple quotes. Fallibilism, per se, is the doctrine that our knowledge is never absolute, but always swims, as it were, in a continuum of uncertainty and of indeterminacy. So knowledge is never absolute. It's always swimming in a continuum of uncertainty and indeterminacy. We cannot in any way reach perfect certitude or exactitude. We never can be absolutely sure of anything, nor can we with any probability ascertain the exact value of any measure or general ratio. That's purse. Um, as I said... Like Peirce, Popper seems to be thinking about scientific inquiry and developing his fallibilistic views. Um, Peirce introduced the notion, but my impression is that Popper is the one who's been the most um, well-known and influential advocate of fallibilism. Um, now, his advocacy of fallibilism uh, involves certain views about um, how we form views about beliefs about the future and scientific theories and so forth. Traditionally, philosophers have thought that we use inductive inference and he rejects induction, thinks that's a myth, and says instead that what happens is we make conjectures which we then try to test. And so the method of science but also of ordinary thought is the method of conjectures and refutations. Where we're just trying to make guesses and we hold those guesses if we haven't been able to show them to be false. Um, the, in science what happens is theories are proposed, scientists propose hypotheses, these hypotheses are then tested, um, if they pass the tests they're kept, if, they're, if they don't pass the test they're rejected. Popper doesn't think that any theory is ever established with finality. Nothing is ever proven. No theory is ever proven to be true. Um, this is for a variety of reasons, but one is that observations, observational, uh, so when we've observed the world with our senses, what we've observed might lead us to come up with a false belief. Uh, we might in some way be mistaken, or we might misunderstand what we've observed and so misinterpret it. Um, theories 
may have to be changed when new information comes on board, new information, new, new, new observations are made that may not fit with existing theories, so the theories have to be changed. Um, or a theory that's been well established might get tested by a new, um, in a new way and might have to be rejected because even though it fit with previously known facts, it's now made a mistake in prediction and failed the test. Um, so for Popper, and he seems to have this view across the board, but with respect to science, the thought is that science is always open to change um, and we're never going to have theories that are proven to be true. So he thinks we should reject this quest for certainty um, but rejecting the quest for certainty is consistent with our still seeking truth and our still attempting and even managing to acquire knowledge just won't be that the knowledge or the truth that we obtain is knowledge or truth that we know with certainty, right? We're going to still get truth, we're going to still get certain knowledge, but we're just not going to have certain truth or certain knowledge. Um, he thinks, for example, that if we show a belief to be false, show a theory to be false, that counts for something. That's actually progress. We make an advance if we show that some view we have is false. That's actually a contribution to knowledge. And he thinks this is just a plain truth. Here's what he says. This is no more than a plain truth. There are few fields of human endeavor, if any, which seem to be exempt from human fallibility. So he's actually allowing the possibility that there might be a field that's exempt from human fallibility. What we once thought to be well established or even certain may later turn out to be not quite correct, but that just means false, and in need of correction. By fallibilism, I mean the view that we may err and that the quest for certainty, or even the quest for high probability, is a mistaken quest. But this does not imply that the quest for truth is mistaken. On the contrary, the idea of error implies that of truth as the standard of which we may fall short. It implies that though we may seek for truth, and that we may, we may even find truth, as I believe we do in very many cases, we can never be quite certain that we have found it. There's always a possibility of error, though in the case of some logical or mathematical, logical and mathematical proofs, this possibility may be considered slight. So you can see he's actually hedging a tiny bit. He may not be pushing for an extreme fallibilism. He might be allowing there's some areas in which we're going to get something close to the truth, uh, so, something close to certainty. Um, now, how is the fallibilist then going to be replying to the skeptic? Well, you've already sort of seen the way this is going to go, but just to spell it out, um, the fallibilist, someone like Popper, someone like Peirce, is going to say that the skeptic has set the standard for knowledge too high. What standard have they set? Well, they've set the standard of certainty. They're requiring certainty. They're claiming or assuming that we must have certainty in order to have knowledge. And the fallibus view is that the skeptic has made a mistake in setting the standard that high. It's a mistaken uh, standard. Knowledge doesn't require certainty. Um, and so we can acquire knowledge even if we fall short of certainty. That's the general response. Let me say a little bit more specifically how this, um, the Felbus will apply to the Cartesian skeptic that I described earlier uh, and also to the Peronians. Um, so the Cartesian skeptic is somebody who's going to be arguing that we don't have any knowledge because we fail to have certainty um, and the kind of thing that's used to establish that will be an evil demon scenario. The thought will be how do you, you're not capable of showing that we're not subject to a total massive illusion so you can't be certain that uh, there's even an external world. Um, you can't be certain there's an external world um, then you don't know there's external world so you just you know you're, you're in a position of, of extreme skepticism about the external world. And the fallibus is simply going to reply to that, that um, that's assuming that certainty is required. We don't need certainty. We don't need to be able to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that we're not 
subject to the massive illusion created by an evil demon, or that we're not brains in the back. That level of certainty is not required for us to know perfectly well that there's an external world. We don't need to be able to prove with absolute certainty that there is no evil demon. As for the Peronian, for the weaker form of skepticism, at least what I take to be a more moderate form of skepticism, um, the Peronian has told us that we must, or we sh- they can't actually say must, because that would seem to th- make them uh, know that they must, or they try to create in us a suspension of belief by pointing to a conflict between opposing perceptions. Well, the response now is, all this has shown is that there are circumstances in which sometimes our senses may mislead us somewhat, um, but we can handle that. We can still have justified beliefs based on sense experience, they'll just be fallible beliefs based on sense experience. As for the problem of the criterion, which is the regress problem, the fallibles can reply in a couple of ways. Um, The normal fallibilist will simply say, look, you can justify beliefs by providing your reasons. You don't have to get dragged in this infinite regress of reasons. You're going to give perfectly sound reasons, and that's all you need to do. You don't need to get dragged into this, this regress. That's what a normal uh, skeptic uh, fallibilist will say. Um, Popper, on the other hand, um, thinks that we don't justify beliefs anyway, so um, he's going to avoid the regress by refusing to justify beliefs. This has to do with the thought that you uh, try to falsify beliefs and you only you accept beliefs which have not shown to be, been shown to be false. So he has a different way of avo- avoiding the regress. Um, but either way, you've got uh, replies that the fallibilist can give to the skeptic. Right, but you might not like fallibilism, or at any rate, um, there can be some objections to it. Uh, A lot of philosophers are going to be inclined towards some form of fallibilism, um, but there's a a few ways of arguing against it or objecting, and here's one sort of uh, objection that is kind of a prima facie objection that's worth trying to to respond to. consider a couple different ways. Um, I've got a a link on the website to an article by Stephen Hetherington called Fallibilism. Um, Some of what I'm about to say comes from that. Um, The objection I'm going to present, I think he calls the objection from linguistic oddity. Um, And the thought is that fallibilism seems to lead us to say something a little bit odd. about knowledge or about what we know. So here are a number of claims that you might think that fallibilism would lead us to assert. Um, Given that the fallibilist has said that certainty is not required for knowledge, looks like these are the kind of things that fallibilists might be saying um, are okay to say, right? Well, you never know what the weather's going to be in Melbourne, so um, this had about a 50% chance of being right. Um, I know that it's raining. Right? Here's a, I know that it's raining, but of course I might be mistaken. Right? I know it's raining, but I might be mistaken. Another similar claim. I know this lecture is in the old arts building, but it could be the old quad. I know this is the old arts building, but it could be the old quad. Or, right, this is a Monday lecture, isn't it? It is. I know today is Monday, but perhaps I'm wrong. Right? If you're a fallibilist, you seem to be saying that these are okay things to say. And yet, there does seem to be something a little bit funny about them. Um, these claims seem to commit you, assert to when you're speaking this way, you seem to on the one hand say you know something and then kind of retract it, weaken it. You say you know it's raining and you say you might be wrong, that seems to suggest you don't know it's raining. So the thought is that this is kind of odd. If you say you know something and then immediately add, but I might be wrong should at least give you a bit of pause. Um, Now, how to respond to this? Few ways. Not clear how successful these are. Um, Here's one thought. Admit that there is a linguistic oddity here. If I say, 
this is Monday, but I might be wrong. In fact, it might be Tuesday, or I know this is Monday. I know today is Monday, but it might be wrong, and perhaps it's Tuesday. Um, if that's an odd thing to say, and yet fallibilism is right about knowledge, right? Fallibilism is right that knowledge does not require certainty, then if it's in fact an odd thing to say, that seems to suggest that there's something wrong with ordinary English usage. And if that's the case, if fallibilism is right, and ordinary English usage makes us think that it's a, these are funny things to say, then we should correct English usage. Right? We could correct English usage to reflect the fact that, in fact, knowledge is fallible. Right? I mean, if 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 if. If our usage is sort of conflicting with what we should be thinking about knowledge, we could correct usage. That's one possibility. Another way to try to handle the objection from linguistic oddity um, is to notice that fallibility affects the justification aspect of justified true belief account of knowledge. It doesn't affect the truth aspect or the belief aspect. It, um, if you have a justified belief, some beliefs may be very well justified, some may be weakly justified, some may be conclusively justified. Certainty is going to be at the top end of the scale. Um, but the fact that justification admits of degrees allows that sometimes you can be justified where you're not conclusively justified in believing something. And the thought is that when we allow that we might be wrong in a claim to knowledge, that sort of reflects the fact that sometimes justification is not conclusive. And this is just the way justification is. Sometimes it's conclusive, but sometimes it isn't. And so sometimes when we say we know something, it actually is the case that we're not fully justified in the belief. And so speaking in that way kind of reflects the fact that sometimes our justification is less than full. A couple of remarks that might help deal with objection for linguistic oddity. Hetherington actually has a proposal that I find quite um, suggestive. I think this is along the right lines. Um, what he points out is that in those statements, like I know that it's raining but I might be mistaken, or I know this is old arts but it could be the old quad, he thinks there's two different kind of perspectives that um, aren't being distinguished. One is the perspective that he calls the perspective of the inquirer, and the other is the perspective of the epistemologist. And he thinks that these claims are somehow faulty because they don't take into account these two different kinds of perspectives. Um, so how does this work? There's a perspective of the inquirer. That's a fancy word. Um, somebody wants to know whether it's raining. The person who wants to know whether it's raining um, you know, is interested in whether it's raining. That's, they're not an epistemologist. They're not thinking about, they're about knowledge. They just want to know whether it's raining or whether it's Monday or whether this is the old arts building or not. Right? So that's one perspective you might have when you're asking whether you know something. But in another perspective, and a different perspective, is that of the theorist of knowledge, the epistemologist, who's wondering about knowledge and who's claiming that, in fact, knowledge is fallible. And Heatherington's thought is that when you say something like, I know it's raining, but I might be mistaken, that actually is running two of these, these two perspectives together. The inquirer, the one who wants to know whether it's raining, is just going to look out the window and see whether it's wet. And then they're going to say it's raining. They're not going to say it's raining, I might be wrong. They're just going to say it's, it's raining. Whereas the epistemologist, they're not interested in whether it's raining. They're just going to say knowledge is fallible. So in a sense, these statements that seem linguistically a little bit uncomfortable that it looks like fallibilism is licensing might actually be statements that nobody's ever going to be asserting because the fallibilist is just making a general claim about knowledge and isn't going to be saying you could say this right? the person who is interested in whether it's raining isn't going to be too concerned about 
stating an epistemological thesis every time they assert that it's raining or not. So that's a some uh, attempts to handle the issue of linguistic oddity. Um, you might or might not think that this is a, a fundamental problem um, for the fallibilist. Uh, what I want to ask now is just how um, full-blown a position fallibilism is. You saw that Popper equivocated a little tiny bit. Um, how far does the claim of fallibility with respect to knowledge and fallibilism about knowledge go? Does uh, the fallibilist think that we should be um, uh, prepared to allow fallibility with respect to all areas of knowledge or is it possible, does the fallibilist have a restricted view? And it looks like you can distinguish in general between uh, two broad forms of fallibilism. One is a quite strong radical fallibilist who says everything's fallible and the other um, is a more limited fallibilist who thinks there can be some things that um, maybe we can be certain of, uh, but others that we can't. Um, so what you might have is somebody who is a fallibilist about, um, say, theoretical science, physics, high-level theorizing. Fallibilist there, but is not a fallibilist about what immediate sense experience tells us. Right? So, there's a hand. That's something you can know for certain, but high-level physics? No. That's something you can't know for certain. So that's one way of being a fallibilist. Fallibilist with respect to theoretical science, not a fallibilist with respect to immediate sense perception. Um, another way is, in a sense, to um, work with an a priori, um, a posteriori distinction, um, you might want to be a fallibilist about knowledge arrived at by experience, so a fallibilist about empirical knowledge, but not a fallibilist about logic and mathematics. You might think that we're able to have certain knowledge, uh, have certainty about logic and mathematics, but when it comes to what we know by means of experience, there we can't have certainty. So there'd be a couple of ways in which you might, might go. Um, then if you're, so those are two ways in which you might be um, less than fully um, full-blown fallibilist. Um, but if you're a radical fallibilist or a complete fallibilist, you're simply going to say there is no area of human knowledge where there is certainty, um, nor is certainty possible in those areas. Now, um, I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of ways you might want to go if you're going to go down a sort of a limited or restricted um, fallibilist path. One is the kind of view you might arrive at if you were following Descartes. If you follow Descartes, you reflect upon those things which you're not capable of doubting. And you think about the cogito, um, you recognize that if you doubt, then there must be something that's doubting, so you can't actually doubt that. You must be certain of at least one thing, namely that you exist. Uh, possibly you're going to be able to add on a few more things that follow pretty closely upon that. Uh, and the thought might be that there's going to be a limited range of things about which we can't be wrong. And then we can be fallibilist about much of the rest. But you could imagine um, taking the view that there's a certain number of things that we're certain of. And it's something like, I think, therefore I am, and then maybe a few other things that you might be able to tease out of that as close consequences of that first thought. So that would be something about which you might be certain, even though beyond that, you'd say, well, we can't be certain of the rest. Um, second sort of recipe for a restricted fallibilist is actually a position um, that we're going to look at tomorrow. Um, Moore is not a fallibilist um, at all with respect to certain level of knowledge. Um, 
more has a proof of the existence of the external world, uh, which he's going to pose against the skeptic, and it's a very simple proof. It's just here's one hand and here's another, so at least two things exist, uh, and he can go on and prove a whole bunch of other things exist in the same way. Um, and his thought would be basically, you can't be mistaken about those fundamental truths uh, that are immediately given to you like that. Well, if you're persuaded by more, um, then you might think that there's going to be a range of truths that we can't be wrong about. And so you might be prepared to be a fallibilist, but not about these kind of basic Morian facts. So those would be a couple of ways in which you could adopt a restricted fallibilism. Um, you might not be persuaded by that, and you might want to go for full-blown fallibilism. Um, that's fair enough. Tomorrow, we'll be looking at another response to skepticism, um, which is Moore's attempt to actually, against the skeptic, prove the existence of an external world, in a sense, by appealing to immediate facts. Um, and we'll talk tomorrow about whether that is going to beg the question. Now, we've got plenty of time for questions. Nick. Um, when you were talking about what certainty means, you said that certainty doesn't mean that a proposition is necessarily true. Right. You said that it's only that it's subject to the highest possible state of justification that it could be in. That's but my thought. Would the highest possible state of justification be a necessary truth? So, apology. Well, okay. It justifies anything else. So, there's the. No, that's not. I, how am I going to get this? We have the reason for believing the necessary truth, right? The necessary truth can't be false. But you could mistakenly believe it's false, right? Or you could mistakenly believe that some truth is a necessary truth, and it isn't, right? So, I, in a sense, it's a, it's a we're distinguishing the epistemic point of whether we have a high degree of justification. We're, we're distinguishing that from whether the claim is a necessary or contingent claim, and the thought is. Um, you may, it may be that those truths that we can be most certain of are the necessary truths, right? That, you may be right that um, tautologies are just so glaringly obviously necessarily true that once you've recognized them, you're going to be certain of them. But um, their truth is one thing, the reason for believing it is another. And I'm trying to put certainty on the side of reason for believing rather than that kind of modal um, property of, of being necessarily true. And I can imagine somebody saying, uh, you can be certain of a necessary truth like a tautology, but I... I can also imagine somebody say there, there are some contingent truths that we can know just as well. I mean, if Moore is right about knowing his hand, I'm sure that Moore would have thought he was just as certain of the existence of his hand that, as of the truth of a, of a tautology. So, but do you see that this, it, it's, it's, the, it's whether the truth is a necessary or contingent truth is one thing, and then the reason we have for believing it is another. I'm trying to put certainty on the side of the reason we have for believing it rather than the status of whether a, a claim is necessary or, or, or not. Other questions? Paul? Just a basic one on fallibilism. I'm just wondering whether or not the, uh, the broad theory of fallibilism would be one thing that fallibilists uh, would say was infallible. Um, yeah. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to think that Popper would have done that. He, he would have... Um, he, he, so what, how would we do that? We would say one thing we know for certain is that knowledge is fallible. Yeah. It looked like you, you'd probably not want to do that for the same reason that you don't want to be the classic academic skeptic. Um, it would, someone like Popper is really you know, proposing a conjecture. He might have been personally quite dogmatic, but the philosophical position would be something that he would be proposing um, as, I think, a conjecture about us, uh, the kind of beings we are, or the kind of beings who um, uh, come up with knowledge uh, in this kind of conjectural way. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I, I agree that you could try to state, you could, you could suggest that fallibilism should be stated as the one thing that we can be certain of is that knowledge is, 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 um, is fallible. Um, I'd be surprised if we find them doing it. You might have to argue that they ought to. No, no. Not sure that they have to. Other questions? I'm not sure how the moral argument refutes fallibilism as such. I mean, because fallibilism doesn't necessarily, I mean, more works against the skeptic. Yes. But fallibilism doesn't actually say this is right or wrong. It just says it may happen that this could be wrong or, or could need updating. Right. So I didn't mean to present the Moorian position as uh, refuting fallibilism. Um, I was, or at least restricting it. I mean, the yeah, I, 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 I was, I was, as a, as a kind of a taste for um, um, to try to give a sense of how one might want to be a fallibilist, but not a fallibilist, um, a kind of an extreme fallibilist. Um, there might be. It looks like you could be a fallibilist about certain areas of knowledge while not wanting to be about a fallibilist about some other areas of knowledge. And, for example, you can imagine somebody being persuaded by Moore that there are a number of things that we just can't be mistaken about, um, and it might be fairly basic truths, um, and then saying, okay, uh, I'm not going to be a fallibilist there, but I will be a fallibilist about many other matters. So the thought was, um, I'm trying to give an indication of how you might be a restricted fallibilist. Right. And there might be, one, one way you might be a restricted out fallibilist would be to take the, the Morian truths, mm. um, and those are things we can be certain of, but not all truths are Morian truths. Right. Other questions? Just uh, another one that brings me back into being skeptical about things, I guess, but... Um, when we're looking at this problem of certain uh, making judgments, but we can't ever escape the fact that it's a human or we are humans who are making these sorts of evaluations and judgments. Um, and so I'm just wondering how the uh, supports certainty as uh, one of the achievements that I can't be certain would say, well, this is the mechanism, this is the process that we actually get there, this is the way we've done it. Goals and so I, I just can't quite see if it's people doing these calculations in the biological state that surely that's going to lead you to fallibilities in the process. Right. And, and there's always going to be something. I mean, I guess it's, it's a good question of how do you, what do you get to happen? What's, what do you think would be in the case of so? Well, we've got Descartes who thinks cog the cogito is something of, of which we can be certain, right? Um, the, the one, if you, if you doubt, if you're actually doubting, if you are the, in the process of doubting, then you are in the process of thinking, and you cannot doubt that. So that's something that somebody might feel they're certain of, and somebody thinking those, along those ways would be more certain of that than there would be of any biological theorizing about their nature, um, right? So that, uh, um, in a sense, the biological thinking. Okay, if we have this other perspective, which is that we're biological organisms, and the way we operate is such that um, we must be making errors some of the time because limits on our perceptual apparatus. Um, that's already to kind of reject skepticism by assuming that we actually know that we're organisms, right? And then, I mean, it's a kind of a naturalistic thing, which is to take the view that uh, we know about ourselves basically by way of scientific knowledge, um, and, you know, basically I, I think that that's not going to take skepticism too seriously. Um, my own view is actually that that's the right way to go, but... Um, uh, I mean, that's, that's a response to the, the skeptic, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a non-trivial question whether the naturalist actually can 
engage with the skeptic and show the skeptic to be wrong rather than simply rejecting them uh, and, and they may not actually have something compelling to say against them. Nick? This might be a stupid question. But what do we say in philosophy? There's no such thing as stupid questions, uh, with some exceptions. Go ahead. Um, how does Popper account for knowledge? Because we say that knowledge is epistemically justified true belief, and if the things that we he doesn't like that. Shown to be false, how can we say that they were true without there an instance of yeah. he, he Popper won't actually buy that knowledge is justified true belief. Um, he, he, because he doesn't like justification. Um, he, but he thinks that we, he, he likes truth. Um, and you know, he, he, the, we're just not going to have certainty. Um, uh, he has a perfectly non-epistemic correspondence theory of truth. The truth is correspondence, um, and you might think, uh, how does Popper actually distinguish himself from the skeptic? Well, he, he's going to be saying that he knows some things. You press him, he's going to say, "Well, I'm not certain." But he thinks it's possible for our views to be true. And you might, there have been people who thought, I really don't see how you've defeated the skeptic here. Um, how does he support that? I don't know, I, I know it, but I'm not certain. Right, so the idea is that um, for Popper, we have beliefs or theories which we have attempted to show to be false. And if we haven't shown them to be false, we maintain them, we retain them tentatively until such time as they are shown to be false, right? So all of our beliefs are held tentatively. And beliefs, um, if they have no counter evidence to them, we can hold them. But he doesn't think that they're shown to be true. He doesn't think they're certain. He doesn't think they're proven. They're just such that we have not yet shown them to be false. And take, what would you do to show a, view, a belief to be false? Well, in many cases, uh, you'd be looking for some kind of observation that would show it to be false. But even observations can be mistaken. So when we think that um, we've uh, made observations that support a, that. <laughs> have fitted with the view but haven't shown to be false, even the observation might be mistaken. So we have to be um, tentative in accepting what observation tells us. But the idea is that you hold on to your beliefs until such time as they're shown to be false. Showing is even a bit strong, because they can't be proven to be false. Yeah? Um, does that mean that something can't possibly be falsified as well? The... He certainly thinks they can be falsified, but they can't be decisively falsified. Right? They can be, we can, so even the falsification is, you know, it's, you have an experience and you will accept the experience as for what it is and um, if, it, if, the observa if the observation fits with your belief, then you continue to accept your belief. If it conflicts with your uh, belief, then you reject the belief. But the observation itself can't be proven. Um, you, you could keep testing an observation statement, and he says there's no natural point where you would stop that test. But the thought is, you know, um, is this a hand? Well, we look on all sides. You guys come up and see if it's attached to my body. Somebody bites it to see whether it's made of flesh as opposed to wax. After a while, we say, that's enough tests. Now, even though we could think of lots of other tests, maybe we should dissect this hand. And, um, you know, you, but you, sort of, you come to an end of your questioning, and you accept the view that it's a hand tentatively. Now, it means that falsification is never... Like, it's not like proven to be false. But you're still sort of taking observation at face value. Justin and then Artem. Well, Artem first, because he hasn't asked a question yet. <laughs> Sorry, was that fair? Was that fair or not fair? If that wasn't fair, you tell me. That's fair. <laughs> Want to vote? Artem. And then Justin. Um, so, if you think that justification can come in degrees, yes. and you're not a radical fallibilist, yep. um, won't you pretty much be like a restricted fallibilist? Most, right. Would most, be, you know, most theories of knowledge be 
some kind of restrictive So I'm not sure I see that. Suppose that you think justification comes in degrees, but wouldn't that be consistent with either being a fallibus across the board or a fallibus in some particular areas? Oh, I, I see. Because if you think you can be certain in some areas, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't think that justification comes in degrees in those areas. Is that your thought? Oh, no, just be, I mean, it kind of makes uh, Sheldon's like a pretty comfortable position that with regards to the empirical kind of claims, yep. um, you know, there's some degree of fallibility. Um, we might never get to 100% kind of a justificatory kind of status. Um, and so it's going to come in degrees and we're going to be fallible and we'll still call it knowledge. Right. Isn't that kind of really popular? I, I think that I think I think a lot of people would go along with that. Yeah, um, but so your your thought was, if you allow that justification comes in degrees, is that going to commit? You, did you think that would be either restricted or radical fallibilism? Or that would, I don't know. I, it seems to me you, you, you can 